In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, And let them be for the signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of heavens. So God created the sea creatures, and every living creature that moves, with which waters swarm, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Jordan Peterson's most watched YouTube series is called The Psychological Significance of the Biblical Stories, the majority of which uh, of his time he spends on Genesis 1 to 4. He makes the point that in millennia past, kingdoms have risen and fallen, castles have been built and crumbled, But throughout all that, the existence and explanatory power of Genesis 1 to 4 has remained. He says you can't understand Western civilization without it. And if you're sitting in this room, even if you don't believe Genesis, even if you've never read it before, it has played a significant role in your society and, dare I say, your own thought. At least in some way, it's in your head. And actually, the Bible says it's not just Western civilization you can't properly understand. It's God and the world. Genesis 1 to 4 is the foundation for everything. And in this series over the next few months, we're going to be seeing and meeting the living God. We're going to see what it really means to be human. And we're going to see what has gone wrong with the world. This evening, we're starting at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start. Genesis chapter 1 is probably the most standout piece of prose ever written. When you have heard it read once, you'll never forget it. It was written by Moses, who is a literary genius. Chapters, uh, verse, chapter 1 verse 1 to 2 verse 3 stands outside the historically narrated main body of the letter, 
which starts from chapter 2, verse 4 onwards. And it sets up the whole thing, as well as the whole Bible. You'll know there's been much debate around this chapter, but if we try and understand what Moses meant as he wrote it, we can't go far wrong. Rather than bring all our assumptions to the text, we'll do much better to follow Moses' agenda. And Moses did not know, and I imagine at the time did not care very much about modern cosmology. He uses ancient cosmological categories to communicate foundational truths about the creator and his creation. And if we're willing to lay down our scientific snobbery for a moment, we will see Moses accurately reflects the world in which we live. He describes creation in a phenomenological way. That is, he's describing the universe as we experience it, as we see and observe it. The earth beneath our feet, the heavens above, and for example, in verse 14, the lights are in the expanse of the heavens, and in verse 20, the birds fly across the expanse of the heavens, which is how we experience them, isn't it? And actually, it's how everyone who's ever lived has experienced it. Uh, it's pan-cultural, pan-temporal. It works in every culture, in every time. And remarkably, what Genesis 1 is describing is how the creator created the world in an anthropocentric way. It is concerned with explaining man in the arena, the arena of existence that we find ourselves in, how and why we are here. And in verses 1 to 25, which we're concentrating on this evening, um, they're laying down the table for the arrival of man in verse 26. And the big thing we're going to see is the power and purposefulness of God's creative word. And as it was read, you'll have noted um, the account is selective, it's stylized, and it's highly sophisticated. For example, there are different significant numbers repeated throughout the account, mainly sevens or multiple of seven, with a few threes and a ten thrown in for good measure, the importance of which we'll draw out as appropriate. And if you read it carefully, you'll also notice that days one to three mirror days four to six. There's a little table on your handout that shows that. On day one, you get day and night, which corresponds with the sun and moon on day four. The heavens and the waters on day two, and the fish and the birds on day five. The land on day three, and the land animals on day six. Now, observationally, Moses would know that you need the sun created on day four for daylight and to mark morning and evening, which were created on day one. Moses is not writing to satisfy all our scientific questions, You'll need to look elsewhere for that, and it will probably require more than a page and a bit of A5. So what is Moses saying? Well, firstly, in verse 1, we see God's supremacy in creation. Verse 1 again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It is a universal statement. God created the heavens and the earth, the whole cosmos. There is nothing outside of his domain. God is unchallenged. Nothing stands before him, and he is dependent on nothing and no one but himself. Unlike other creation counts in the ancient world, there is no cosmic battle. The Babylonians, for example, held the cosmos is made from this, the dismembered dead carcass of a defeated God. Moses tells us that in the beginning there was God, and he created the heavens and the earth. Every atom bends to his will. Every breath we breathe, we take at his pleasure. God is supreme. Next in verse 2, we see the starting problem, which is useless, uninhabitable, uncreation. Now, problem is not quite the right way of putting it. I couldn't I think of a better way of doing it. Um, but it's a situation that needs to be changed for God to achieve his purposes. It is the narrative problem that Genesis 1 sets up. So we see that in verse 2. There it describes that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. What Moses is addressing in this verse is not the modern concern about the origins of matter. How did something physical come from nothing physical? But it's a concern about purpose. How did nothing useful turn into something useful? How do you go from a blank and empty canvas to a world teeming with life? 
The problem is stated in that first clause. The earth was without form and void. The earth was a lumpless, shapeless clay, empty of life. Darkness was over the face of the deep. It was as useless as if you'd knocked over a slush puppy in the dark. It did not yet have purpose. The world is uninhabitable, it is formless, and it's uninhabited, it is void of life. And the only other times um, the words formless and void are used or paired in the Bible together is in Jeremiah chapter 4, which is clearly drawing on Genesis chapter 1. And in Jeremiah, it's speaking about the absolute destruction of the land by invading armies. God was judging his people for their continued wickedness and evil. And this is how Jeremiah describes the catastrophic result in chapter 4, verse 23. Jeremiah said, I looked on the earth, and behold, it was without form and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. So in Jeremiah, after God's judgment, the land looks as if it's been decreated. It looks like Genesis 1, verse 2. It's a lifeless, lightless lump. It's uninhabitable. Figuratively speaking, it is uncreated. The problem is the earth was not fit for life. It is purposeless and needs to be shaped. But in the next sentence, we get the source of the solution. Because we read in the second half of verse 2, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The potter is wetting his hand, ready to mould the clay. Or in terms um, more accurate of my childhood, it's the height of excitement when you've created your own map on Roller Coaster Tycoon 2. You've given yourself the biggest footprint you can manage on the game, and you've given yourself a gazillion pounds in the bank account, um, which you can't possibly spend all of. And your mouse is hovering over the blank canvas, ready to create the best virtual theme park the world has ever seen. <laughs> the anticipation is palpable. The Spirit of God is about to do the creative work of God. Out of the waters, a new creation will emerge. And that's what we see in the rest of the verses, in verses 3 to 25. We see God's spoken solution, useful, inhabitable creation. And as we read through verses 3 to 13 again, and just think to yourself, what impression do you get about God and his creation? So read through some of those verses again. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which their seed each according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and morning the third day. Just the first half there, but what impression do you get about God and his creation? You can't not notice the repeated pattern, can you? God said... The thing happens, God inspects it, and he sees it as good, and there is evening and there's morning. It is controlled, methodical, deliberate process. God speaks, it happens. God speaks, it happens. God speaks, it happens. There is no chaos. He is in supreme control. And that's highlighted in a number of other ways as well. In verse 21, it said, God created the great sea creatures which is a word sometimes translated as dragons, the powerful, scary creatures in the ocean that seem untamable and dangerous. 
the proverbial Loch Ness monsters of the world, which some societies viewed as having a role in the battle of creation. But no, great white sharks and the like are simply creatures crafted by the word of God, like everything else. And similarly, he polemically or pointedly describes the sun and the moon in verse 14. Some cultures, and I believe some cultures still around the world, worship the host of heaven, the sun and the moon, partly because of their obvious power and importance they have in the world. But they're not even given the dignity of a name here. In verse 14, uh, it says this, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. To God, they're just like lamps that he could have picked up from Ikea at the weekend. The furniture of the sky is spoken into existence by his word. Everything in the whole cosmos seems effortlessly created by him. And again and again, we read this, that God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. But why? What does it mean? Now, I really like trees, I like lakes, I like oceans and sunrises, and even in the dark depths of London, it's thrilling to be in Victoria Park as the sun rises and you see the world light up. Dare I say it, it's good. But I think the direction of this chapter gives us even more than that. Light and dark, night and day, earth and sea, plants and fruit. They aren't just nice. They make the world inhabitable for all its inhabitants. They set the stage for life. But as we reach the filling in verses four to six, we see the stages being set for one life form in particular. For example, in verse 14, signs and season, days and years are only really meaningful to humanity. I think that is even clearer when we translate seasons um, as occasions or festivals. That's a word used about 160 times in the Bible, and it's never used for seasons of the year. Now, my wife's birthday is an occasion, and some might even argue that she makes it a festival, <laughs> as she makes it clear that she understands it as a birthday week. It's a fixed appointment in the calendar, made possible by day four of creation. But tigers and tarantulas don't care about birthdays, and men and women do, or, or some do more than others. And the signs, occasions, days and years are marked out for man. We've already noted the human perspective on day five, so let's look at day six in verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Even before humanity enters the stage in the second half of day six, there is a strong hint that animals are for us. Um, livestock. Livestock are domesticated animals raised by humans for produce. Salamanders can't be shepherds, uh, but men and women can, even Jeremy Clarkson. And the whole ecological system of the world is set up for man. The lights, the earth and the sea, the plants and the animals are made for the arena of human existence. And God saw that they were good as they fulfilled their intention well. They are pleasing not just because uh, they are in and of themselves, but because they are purposeful. They have set the stage for life and ultimately for humanity to continue God's purpose in creation. We'll explore that purpose more fully in the next few weeks. But for now, we've seen that God spoke, the atoms obeyed without question, and he made a good world for us. So as we pause here, let's draw a few impl important implications uh, from the chapter so far. The first is our worldview. And that is just to say, uh, to acknowledge that we have a creator. The Bible says that deep down we all know that, even if some of us have pressed it uh, very deep down. It is inescapable, because as we see his world, it is undeniable. When I listen to those Jordan Peterson lectures, I'm not quite sure I'm clever enough to understand his explanation uh, for the compellingness of Genesis. 
It's something to do with our subconsciousness and our dreams projecting meaning. But I think it's compelling because it's true. And any alternative explanation doesn't match with the reality we all live in. Our worldview. And the second implication is wonder. As some key preparation for uh, this sermon series, I've been watching some of David Attenborough's Our Planet on Netflix. And although the orchestral music and the whispering voice is getting a tad cliche these days, it's undeniable that the planet God has made is awe-inspiring. Just watching the first few minutes of every episode it is mind-blowing. Seeing the vastness of the great forests of the earth, the immensity of waterfalls, the life-giving power of fresh water to parched lands, the unbelievable diversity of life from the bottom of the ocean to the birds in the sky, billions of species of animals and plants and insects. God's handiwork is awe-inspiring. Or perhaps for you, there's nothing more spectacular than the subtle beauty of an English country estate in summertime, and you've reached the age when being a National Trust member is no longer too embarrassing to admit. God's world is a wonderful place and a good place to live. It is the case that after the fall, not everything is as it should be. And we'll get to the marring of God's perfect world also in the weeks to come. But even now, after the fall, we can still see the wonder and goodness of God's creation. And ultimately, it reflects on him. If you venture down the road during the day to St. Paul's Cathedral, you can go into the crypt and see a tomb of its great architect, Sir Christopher Wren there. And on his tomb is a plaque which says in Latin, um, translated to English, if you're seeking his monument, look around you. If you're seeking his monument, look around you. Well, the whole cosmos is the cathedral of God. It's his CV which speaks for itself about who God is and what he is like. And actually, the communication the cosmos gives us requires a response. The wonder of creation should provoke both awe and fear. That's the point that the psalmist in Psalm 33 was getting at, which we read together earlier. Here are some of those verses again. He said, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the whole world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. When we realize that God created all things, that he created us, that every breath we breathe is only possible at his pleasure. It is a fearful thing. We owe our very existence to him. He is really very powerful, and we should treat him with the respect he deserves. And how can we not fear and stand in awe of him when we see the world he has made? The wonder of creation and our creator. And the third implication is about how God works. So first, um, we saw the tight connection between God's spirit and his word, if we're paying close attention um, to verses two and three. It is the spirit of God who hovers as the potter above the clay of creation. And in verse three, it's God who speaks to form and to fill it. God's word and God's spirit work inseparably together. The Hebrew word spirit um, means it has the idea of wind or breath. And it is as God speaks, as he breathes out words from his mouth, the world is created. That is how Psalm 33 understood it. It translated spirit as breath in verse 6. The word and the spirit form a parallel in creation. So by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath or spirit of his mouth, all their host. From creation, God has worked powerfully by his spirit through his word. And to separate the two in the work of God is anathema to the Bible. And on a number of levels, we see that Moses wants to set up the power of God's creative word. In Genesis 1, here's one of the numbers for us. Um, God speaks 10 times. He says 10 words in creation, which match up with what Exodus calls the 10 words or the Ten Commandments that God gives. 
Those defining commandments aren't arbitrary rules, disconnected from the world, but are spoken with the same authority and in line with the creative word of God. They cut with the grain of creation. In the New Testament, we are no longer bound by them in a covenant, and some of them point beyond themselves and apply differently for us. But nonetheless, they represent moral order in line with God's creation. Moses' creation account is as much concerned with morality as it did with matter, because the touchstone of morality is how we respond to the creator. And we see that even more clearly in the two immediate things in Genesis, um, that setting up God's powerful word um, does for us. The first is, what do you think will be the consequence of defying the word that puts stars into space? How much do you think the disobedience of your creator's command will matter? It is a remarkable thing that it is this word that Adam and Eve will go on to rebel against. How do you think you will fare if you ignore your creator's voice? And lastly, and most importantly, it sets up the promise of God. Humanity does disobey, and from chapters 3 to 11 in Genesis, they spiral calamitously away from their creator. But God makes a promise in chapter 12, and it's essentially a promise to put the world right. He says to Abraham, Go forth from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God will pluck out one refugee and transform the whole world through him. It's a big promise, but essentially it's words to a random man in the Middle East. And if you're an Israelite living after Abraham, how do you know God has the power to come through on his promise? Does this promise really have the power to save the world? Or to move it to our age, can the gospel word really save the world? In the New Testament, we see the word of God promising a new creation. For example, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, it tells us that according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, if you're anything like me, perhaps occasionally um, we lie on our beds at night wondering if God's word really has the power to do what he says it will do. The cosmos feels so fixed, it feels so certain. Um, Can he bring about a new creation? Can he do what he says he will do? And the answer from Genesis 1 is, well, he did it effortlessly the first time. God spoke the world into existence, and through his promise, the Bible says he will do it again. This is the creative power of God's word. And before we see it bringing a whole new world, we've already seen it bringing light and life, haven't we? The first thing God says to a dark world is let there be light. And the power of God's word to bring light to the world is evidenced in any of us who have responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul puts it like this in 2 Corinthians 4. He said, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. As the gospel about Jesus is proclaimed, light erupted in our hearts that we may know God and be truly alive. Paul goes on to say, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It is the powerful, creative word of God that created the world in the beginning, that has made us a new creation, and that will bring in the new creation. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Let's pray together. Our Father, we praise you for your supremacy in creation and thank you that you sustain us now. 
please help us to remember who you really are as creator and trust your powerful word to achieve your good purposes. Amen.